I'm excited to introduce our speaker today. Um, uh, He's a local businessman, spent some time as a professor, and then transitioned to the business world. Lives in Holman, Wisconsin, with his wife and five kids, uh, one of which Jackson here is able to join us today all the way from Fort Worth, Texas. So probably the longest commute or longest trip uh, of someone to be here. So glad you're able to join us. I've been able to know um, Dan here for the last past few months. One thing that I've really learned about Dan is his um, ability to connect and his ability to really just lead people. He told me one of his whys is building things, building people, building businesses, building systems. And a big part of that is building men. And so I'm really excited. His, really the topic today is going to be the power of a man. And so with that, I'm excited to introduce you to my friend, friend Dan Odenbach. Good afternoon. There we go. There we go. All right. Gentlemen, thank you for having me today. Um, the, the nature of our message today is the power of man. I think it's important for you to know um, not so much my business background, but who's standing in front of you. So um, you're going to see this is our technology here today. This is when I'm advancing a slide. So uh, my name is my name's Dan Odenbach. I'm a financial advisor down in the La Crosse area for the, about the last 15 years. Um, I am also an income real estate owner with my wife, and uh, that's a passion area of, of ours as well. Um, business consultant and coach, uh, former UW professor, a father of five, I'm a son, I'm a husband, I'm a sinner, I'm broken, and I'm on life's journey, just like you, okay? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but my microphone is going in and out, right? Okay, I'll just keep talking in the back. Can you hear me at all? Okay, all right. And uh, one, of, one of my disclosures is I do have a cold, not COVID. All right, um, so um, you're fine. Okay, yeah. Um, and I'm grateful every day. And I'm grateful every day, particularly you're going to see a little bit about the story that I tell today. Okay. Disclosures that I do want to share with you. I apologize. I'm going to carry my coffee with me because of the cold that I have. Um, actually, I don't want to, though. Um, that I have broken PowerPoint 101. Those of you that do any presentations, my, my slides are full of information. Hopefully, I'm captivating enough to hold your attention just with the story that I'll tell today. That brings me to my second disclosure. I'm going to tell you a story. It's a little bit different. I'm not going to speak to you in an organized speech, but I'm going to tell you a story. And the reason I'm going to tell you a story is, men, I think there's power historically in telling stories. That's how communication, that's how we mentored, that's how men uh, passed on information. And have you ever noticed that one, when one man lets his guard down, tells a story a little bit, it opens up the opportunity for growth? Have you seen that before? That's what my goal is today. And I hope that through that, we can see a little bit of the power of a man. Okay? So, our story has four chapters. And I tend to walk when I, when I speak a little bit. So if I'm walking over here, you're not in trouble. All right? Four chapters. The first chapter is the man that we learn from seeing and observing other men outside of ourselves. Okay? And this story starts, I'm going to tell you about Danny Odenbach. You don't know exactly who I am, but my name's Dan Odenbach. So the story I'm going to tell you about Danny Odenbach. All right. Danny, ages six to, six to eight, is a very typical, rambunctious, 100% boy. On the run every day, plays every sport possible, um, just loves to be on the move. He remembers when he was young, laying in bed, cut off shorts, a t-shirt, and just laying there until his mother would come into the room and say, you can go. 
and then you you run and you play all day long and because I'm in a room of men uh, my stature and older you just had to be home when what the street lights came on okay so then I would I get home with the street lights okay that was my life always on the move okay however there was another reason I was always on the move and out of the house was because I didn't really understand it but my house wasn't peaceful it wasn't a place I really wanted to be there was always tension mom and dad really didn't get along they never went on dates they seemed to argue quite a bit and so I just didn't it wasn't a place that was caring and that I really wanted to be okay Danny Odenbach moving on age eight to nine he, he develops some friends in the neighborhood and starts to, to realize how important friendships are doesn't really want to be in his own household but finds uh, the reward in developing good friendship in his best buddy Jay Kaiser lives down the block and he would go run uh, with Jay like he normally does but on one specific occasion Jay calls him says hey come on down the block but this time bring your bike and I brought my bike and this is a, it was a different event that I was invited to I pulled up in my bike and there were a, a lot of other kids from the neighborhood underneath the street light all with their bikes you know facing each other talking a lot of them were the older kids that I'd never really met so I pulled up with my bike and all I realized was they were they were all boys and there was something cool I didn't know what it was some of the boys were kind of cussing back and forth I thought that was kind of cool not sure why they were spitting some of them were chewing tobacco thought that was kind of cool don't know why all right but the fact that they allowed me in that was very attractive to me it was very attractive however I pulled up in my bike and I'm kind of the young dumb kid I was kind of I was smart enough to be quiet but at, uh, pretty soon they noticed me and they looked at me and they said hey nice bike I like your banana seat now a lot of you are old enough to know what a banana seat is right okay and I'm like and I'm too dumb to even realize they were ripping on me and I said well thanks I like my banana seat I can ride a buddy on the back and that's not why they were complimenting it and then they say no nice banana seat yeah really like that on your bike and so then I start to get it a little bit they're picking on my bike but because it was a group of guys and they were paying attention to me at least it was all right that was something that made sense but I, I as they were telling some other stories I kind of got it in me a little bit I'm like hey you know what I'm gonna run home my dad's home he's in the garage he's got a whole ton of tools and I bet he might be able to put a single seat on my bike and that'd be a little cooler so I run home and uh, there we go good and my dad's in the garage with Joe Peterson now Joe Peterson just very well have been the original Marlboro man he would smoke more than breathe okay but Joe every time I came around would stop what he was doing and he'd look at me he'd smile he'd kind of shake me on the head it was very attractive to me I liked that that this guy looked at me because when I came in to the garage I was all excited because I was just down with these kids dad 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 these all these kids were there and I got a banana seat and I want to put a single seat on and uh, wait can you help me because you got all these tools and you can do anything with your tools and he said Dan Joe and I are having coffee and I'm like, okay yeah yeah but dad dad there's all these kids and there's I got a banana seat and they got a single seat I really went can you help he's like Dan I told you Joe and I are having coffee now run along and my enthusiasm 
dropped. And I kind of took off, kind of pushing my bike out of the garage. I was confused. My dad had all these tools. He knew how to fix anything. Why wouldn't he help you? Moving on. Age 10. I figured my dad won't help me. I'll get a paper out because my brother's got a paper out. I can make my own money. I can go and get my own single seat. If he's not going to help me, I'll go do it on my own. And if I have my own money, I can just do everything on my own. I don't need my dad. But I, but I still was confused. I wanted his help. But I was very attracted to being down in the neighborhood again with those kids. Now at about age 10, I went down, down the neighborhood and this time the kids were doing something different. And it was, it was uh, a, a scene right out of a movie. There was a big dirt pile, there was all sorts of kids on their bikes and they were up at the top of the hill and they were zooming down and they were jumping their bikes. I was, again, I was kind of a young, naive kid. I really didn't know what they were doing, but man, it looked cool. It looked really cool. And Jay Kaiser was there, and I'm like, what are they doing? They're like, oh, they're jumping. I'm like, all right, are you gonna do it? And he's like, no, I'm not gonna do it, because we're the two young kids. And then, so they kind of said, hey, do you want to do it? Yeah. I figure if I do that, I'm kind of included, right? So I go up on the top, with my bike, my non-banana seat bike now, because I had bought my own single seat, and I go zooming down, and I didn't really know what I was doing. I hit the jump, and I go flying through the air, land with my butt as hard as you can on that single seat, and bounced off of the off of the seat, went flying one way, bike went the other way, and just slid to a, to a halt. I had no idea what was going on. I was butt over tea kettle, and I, I'm kind of trying to figure things out. I look up, but the one thing I see is every one of those guys running towards me, cheering. Oh my gosh, that was amazing, that was me. And I half wanted to cry, half wanted to cheer because it hurt so much. And I remember I loved that. I loved being involved and accepted by that group. However, I looked at my bike and my bicycle was not meant for this. And I had broke it, I had cracked the frame. But here I looked at my bike again, I said, wait a minute. My dad's got a garage full of tools, he can fix anything. I'm gonna bring that back and my dad will help me out. And so I push the bike back and dad's in the garage, this time by himself drinking coffee, All right? And as he's drinking coffee, I said, hey dad, 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 there was these kids and there was a hill and I went down the hill and there was a jump and I didn't know what I was doing, but I landed and then my bike and it went one way, I went the other way. Dad, I need help with my bike though. And he looks at my bike, he said, what'd you do to your bike? I said, dad, there was a jump and I went off and they all cheered. What'd you do to your bike? I said, Dad, I, I, there's a, a break in the bike, but I, I land on this jump. He's like, and he grabs a bike from me. He lifts it up, and he throws it in the trash. He said, looks like you don't have a bike anymore. I didn't get it. I was hurt. I was sad. Why won't my dad, why doesn't he celebrate in the same enthusiasm that I have? Why won't he help me? So, age 11, I start working on a farm. I figure again, my dad won't help me. I'll just work harder. I'll take care of it myself. I'll make more money. I can get a new bike. And I met, I met some, some other guys, Bob, Bill, and Bob Sr. And these were also men that I, I sought their approval. I wanted to work hard. I would work harder than anybody so that these men 
would look at me. In doing so, right about this time, I started to get uh, involved in hockey. And my mother helped me get this favorite hockey stick. And uh, my mom was a spectacular lady. And every time I would compete in sports, I would say, did dad come? Did dad come? And he was never there when I got done. Or he would come and he would leave early. But I, I, my life was just that. I would work and then go do my sports, wish that my dad was there and he wasn't. Now about age 12, I was playing hockey, next slide please. Playing hockey quite a bit. In Minnesota where I grew up, about age 12 you start to do what's called body checking. And so you get to hit people when you're on the ice. I thought that was pretty cool with, with my, my friends. And I realized that if I used my body to run into somebody else, one, they couldn't score, but two, everybody would cheer. And especially all the other dads, when I came out, holy buckets, did you see what Odenbach did? Did you see what Danny Odenbach did to that kid? He laid him out on the ice. Now again, I'm walking out, and now these guys are looking at me like Joe Peterson did, scratching me on the head. And I realized all I had to do was knock people down. Take my body and knock these guys down on the ice. And they, they were impressed by that. I continued to do that. I remember about age 13, we had played a game and we won. And I remember seeing my dad in the stands. And I, 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 I saw that he was there. I came out. I was pretty tired during that game. And for those of you that play hockey, you realize you hold a hockey stick like this. Stick kind of facing up. Okay? I came out into um, the warming area. Here's all my, all my friends, their parents, and my mom and dad are there. And I'm like, yeah, dad's here. Come over to my dad. And I said, dad, we won. And he grabs that stick that my, dad, that my mom had gotten for me. And I had held the stick with it facing down and had coasted a little bit because I was pretty tired in that game. And he took that stick and he said, what the hell kind of way is this to, to use a stick? And he stepped on it. And he broke it in front of all my friends. And at age 13, you're trapped between a boy and a man. You want to cry, but it's not cool to cry. So you fight back the tears until you get in the station wagon. And not only am I hurt and sad, but now I'm developing, I'm starting to get angry. I'm mad. Why won't my dad help me? Why did he just break my favorite hockey stick? get into the car, cry the way home, and start to enter into a time period of life, age 13 through 16, kind of withdraw. Just figure out, my dad's not gonna be there. He won't support me. It doesn't matter that the other dads are proud of me, but I want my dad's approval. So I'm just gonna do things on my own. And I literally start to build a protective shell inside and out. I'm not gonna ask anything of my dad. I'm not gonna expect anything of my dad. And I'm literally gonna start to build an external shell through weightlifting that will allow me to use my body more violently. 
on the hockey ice to knock more people down in football as well that will give me the reward from other men. I was numb. Started drinking during that time. Yes. 13 to 16 years old. These are stories of Danny Odenbach that I'm not really proud of. But when another man shares a story, I think there can be growth. Age 13 to 16, I still worked on that farm and was starting to get quite strong. I would get rewards because they would say, the tractor's broken, go get Dan, he can lift it. Now, I didn't realize that wasn't necessarily a compliment, <laughs> but I thought it was. Chapter one, gentlemen, is what have we learned about being a man from the men that are in our lives, the men that, that are supposed to help us? Maybe for you, hopefully we're spectacular. All those people, all those things that are outside of us help shape us as men. Chapter two is the man inside of us. Who's the man that you start to become because of what you've been exposed to? So our story continues with Danny Odenbach. About age 13 plus, I was lost. I was scared. I was trying to figure things out. Continued to keep building that protective outer shell. Started competing in powerlifting. Because again, the more violent I was with my body, the more response I would get from people. I started to measure how many guys I would knock out on the ice versus goals. It's not something to be proud of, gentlemen. It was so addictive at that time. We're talking about weightlifting to where before I was age 18, I was bench pressing over 400 pounds, and that was my way of dealing with this. It was right about that time that I met Terry Andres. Now Terry was very confusing to me. He owned the fitness center that I was working out at. He was kind. He was very handsome. He was literally Mr. Minnesota in a competitive fashion from bodybuilding. By the world standard, he shouldn't have paid any attention to me, just a young kid. But he looked at me, much like Joe Peterson did. He would look me in the eye, he would almost sh shake me in the head. Hey, I'm gonna help you. Started to, started to change some things in my thinking. Age 15, 18, Danny Odenbach figures out I'll continue to keep doing things just on my own. The stronger I get, the more violent I can be, get, nothing else can hurt me. I'll keep drinking, that'll help numb things too. And not surprising, I get into a fight. I'm from Hastings, Minnesota, which is a small kind of rural area, and there's a lot of rural areas around there. And there was a country dance and there was a misunderstanding, I promise it was a misunderstanding, of a guy who thought I was dating his girl when they were dating, or moving in on his girl. It was just a friend of mine. He walks up to me. I had been at the dance earlier with some friends drinking heavily. I was talking with a friend like this, and I'm a freshman, he was a senior, came walking up next to me and said something about his girlfriend. And I was confused, turned back and looked at my buddy. And all of a sudden, my head was moved and my hat was on the floor, on the ground. And I looked at my buddy and he's like, and I'm like, what? And he's like, he just hit you. Because I had built this external shell and was kind of a mean kid. I really didn't feel it. And I had been drinking all day. 
And I'm like, what should I do? I was scared. He's like, hit him back. So I turned to him. I really couldn't, I drank so much. I really couldn't see him or focus on him that well. But I knew if I grabbed him and I took this hand and brought it to this hand until he stopped moving, then I think I'd win. And that's what I did. He ends it up and ended up in the hospital. Now the part of this, and it's not something to be proud of, but the disturbing part is he was a star on the hockey team. Our industrial arts or tech ed teacher was a Vietnam vet that scared the hell out of all of us. He stopped me in the hallway that Monday in school. And he said, are you Odenbach? I'm like, yes, sir. He's like, did you do that to Steven Aller? Yes, sir. Do you play hockey? Yes, sir. Stay with hockey. I want you to play for me. Was rewarded. Again. Nobody challenged me. Nobody told me I had a brain in my head. Just the more violent you were, the stronger you could make your body, the more attention you would get. Eighteen towards mid-twenties, I thought that life was just about winning. It rewards winning. I was fortunate to receive some awards through athletics, became a college athlete, continued drinking. There were different girls that came into life and you could figure out probably how successful I was with the girls. No mentorship and, and uh, you know, plenty of unsuccess there. Terry died during that time period. The one man who started to consistently and so I was kind of lost. I continued my 20s and 30s. I thought that Danny Odenbach thought that if you just won, if you keep moving, if you stay strong, do it yourself, nothing can hurt you. External rewards came. Work, money, next making a name for myself. Very internally, selfishly focused. And it was right about that time that I started to meet some men down in the Cooley region. That's the La Crosse area. It's called the Cooley region. And I met some men that started to challenge me. And they saw the success that I had from a business standpoint, and that's kind of how we met. But they would look at me. They would ask me ch questions, challenge me. Made me think that I actually had a brain in my head. It was that same feeling like Joe Peterson. It was also right about that time that I had went home and, and I saw my high school hockey coach, Mitch Horsch. Now, those of you who have seen the movie, The Miracle, right, about the 1980 hockey team, just because of how old I am, I'm very fortunate to have played, um, you know, for uh, all of those gentlemen over in, in Minnesota. Mitch Horsch was the 20th person cut from the, or the 21st cut from the roster. He was my coach. I ran into to Mitch after high school my early 20s and I happened to run at him at like a, 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 a family festival and we're talking a little bit and then he says hey how's your dad and I thought that, that's a kind of a strange question and I said well he's, he's okay you know he mom and mom and he got divorced and you know he's living up in the Twin Cities and he said really he said Boy, I always felt bad with you, with your dad. I said, why, Mitch? And he said, you don't know this, but your dad was at almost every one of your hockey games. But I would leave the bench, and I would go stop him 
because he was drinking before the game and he would want to come to the locker room to yell at you. And I would stop him every time. I never knew that. I never knew there were men like Mitch in the world that would look out for him, that would be there, that could be trusted. During this time, I was challenged by these men of the Cooley region. And I remember one of them, David Twight, who has spoken here. How many of you heard Dave speak here? All right. And I met with Dave. We were having coffee, and Dave said, we are kind of talking about business and future and goals and such. And he said, you know what? You know what the thing is with you, Dan? You're too good on your own. You don't really need anybody else. Now, I kind of revert to that stupid kid at that time. I thought that was a compliment. Dave was challenging me. Now, you can see... Next slide, please. You can see that that Chapter 2 man didn't work out real well for me. I didn't have I had an absent father... I had a uh, verbally and at times physically abusive father that led me down a, a pathway that made me think the more violent I was, the stronger I was externally with my body, that's the way that the world would reward me. Now, there's consequences for that. Consequences that in my body right now, I've had four major concussions, two broken noses, my right pec and bicep have been torn, my left pec and, and bicep are currently detached, my left radius and ulnar have been fractured, my right and left hand have all been fractured and all of my fingers have been fractured. Three knee surgeries, two MCLs and one ACL. I had a kidney transplant 30 years ago. Five kidney biopsies. 12 days in the hospital with COVID, followed by another 14 later after that. And I currently do kidney dialysis. And a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> now, gentlemen, I share that. Even if you think about what our world might reward as, as men. Some of that would be celebrated, right? Guys, I share that because the consequences of, of no modeling ended up with these physical ailments. But it pales next in the emotional pain that I've had in my life. Next, the fear, the let down, the letting other people down. The insecurity, the nagging thought in my head. Am I doing this right? Am I enough? I was dominating people on the athletic field and I never felt like I was enough. I felt lost, rejected, confused, tons of regret embarrassment of all those choices in chapter 2. Those things aren't things to be proud of. Felt like I was never enough. Am I succeeding? Do I have what it takes? And when, when do I become a man? Here I was in my mid-twenties, a little boy, not knowing, am I a man? Am I enough? My dad's absence trying to look to other men on TV, in the community, to be my models. That doesn't turn out very well. It manifested over 10 years ago when I invited 10 men down in the La Crosse area and asked them if they would please meet with me at Perkins. They were men like David Twight, Tony Zach, who many of you have met. And all I knew was these were, these were good men. They seemed to care about me. 
and they have their life a heck of a lot better, you know, organized and together than me. I met with them at 9 p.m. at Perkins, and I said, guys, my business life might be successful, but I'm a mess. Will you help me? And they said they would. So they said, here's the, here's the deal, Dan. You don't get to make any more decisions. Because <laughs> I made horrible decisions. And that was good news. That was good news, though. Because the pain that I had in chapter 1, chapter 2, got to start to leave. And chapter 3, next slide, could start to evolve. Gentlemen, many of you have lived this life all along. God, I'm happy for you. So happy for you. It's that, that man that we need to share with each other. That rightly aligned man. The man that could be from birth to adulthood. The man that is grounded. Has grounded models. And realize it's not about them. Okay. I heard Joe speak yesterday and talking about his young men to create unselfish players. You realize that? I didn't know that until later in life. Realize that there's a standard set submitting to God. Measurements of pre-man and manhood. They're established. There's a welcoming to manhood. Have any of you been part of raising a modern day knight? If you haven't, if you have young men, grandsons, sons, look up that resource. Raising a Modern Day Knight. I went through that with my son and about four of his buddies. It welcomes young men into manhood. Do you ever notice we don't have that in America? You know, you're not given a spear and a loincloth and say, go get a tiger and come on back, then you're a man. I don't know if that's real, but it sounds cool. Right? When do you become a man? There is a, va there's a vast amount of power, the power of a man sitting in this room, the influence that we can have, especially on our younger generation. They need it. My gosh, Danny Odenbach needed it. Okay? Understanding and seeing that iron can sharpen iron. And that man doesn't give up on man. All right. I would challenge you, there's two Bible verses here. And there's two different ways that you can approach giving up and supporting a man. The first one is Micah. And many of you know this verse. If a man sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens, you've won a brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two with you. If he refuses, then tell it to the church. And what it actually, I, I didn't type it in. And what he does, if he doesn't turn away, then treat him like a tax collector and turn your back on him. You've given him a chance. You came to him with a brother. But guys, I would challenge you to maybe be more of a, a Galatians man to each other. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help him and personal back on the right path. Be careful not to fall into that trap. But don't turn your back on guys. We need each other, guys. Be there. Be that one guy. Need to have an internal barometer and a compass vision statement. Now part of this good news is that by about age 40, and now I'm a father, and I'm running around the country with my kids at hockey tournaments, and I'm kind of the hockey dad. And amongst all the other men and parents, I'm not only just the hockey dad, but I'm kind of the dad to the group now. 
Um, those of you that have maybe done some traveling and realize there's some extracurricular activities that go on back in the hotels um, and in the bars, and a lot of pe a lot of people uh, go out heavily drinking. I didn't drink anymore at age 40. I was that dad that would be responsible. And so there was a, a group of people at a certain hockey tournament. We had gotten there like maybe four o'clock and they were came into the, the uh, hotel kind of waiting area where we were waiting. They had already been to the bars for quite some time. And we're just sitting there and I'm kind of the responsible dad. So, so they came over and they're giving me a little grief and are you gonna come out with us tonight? No, 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 I'm with my son. And uh, there was a sister of one of the people there. And I didn't really get this at all, but she came up and said, I'm not supposed to talk to you much. Now at this point, I'm a single man because of other choices I made. I really didn't get what the heck she was talking about. But those people went out, including my buddy Chris. They went out for the night. I went up to the, to the room with my son, went to bed. About two in the morning, phone rings. Hey, you need to, you need to come down to the, the lobby. It's a female voice. <coughs> pardon me, pardon me. Hey, you need to come down to the lobby. Female voice on the other phone. And I said, wait, what? Who is this? Is, it, is Chris okay? I knew Chris was driving everybody out that night. And I was worried about Chris. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> I was worried about Chris. <clears throat> I'm actually not that choked up yet. <clears throat> <clears throat> I was worried about Chris. And she just says, come down to the lobby. Put on a shirt. Lock my son in the, the room. I go down to the lobby and nobody's there. I expected to potentially see the police. I didn't see any of that. I go back up to the room. Phone rings again. You need to come down to room 132. Female voice. I'm like, who is this? And is Chris okay? I was kind of out of it at the middle of the night. I'm just thinking about my buddy Chris. And she's just like, you just need to come down to room 132. I said, is Chris there? Is he okay? She said, come down here. Put my shirt back on, lock the door, go down to room 132. I knock on the door. A woman with no clothes on grabs me and pulls me in the room. It was that sister. The room is dark. I'm kind of disoriented. I said, where is Chris? And I'm such an idiot. I said, where's Chris? Is Chris in here? No, Chris isn't in here. You can have anything you want. I turn on the lights. What do you mean I can have anything? She said, you can have anything you want. You can do whatever you want to do. I said, no. I'm not going to do that. And she says, why? And I said, because I'm a Christian and because I need to look my son in the eye. Now here's the good news in that, guys. There is nothing good in me. I can't do that without those men that challenged me, without the transformation, without the healing blood. I can't do that. That's no compliment to me. But I ran out of that room. And I was terrified. 
because I got upstairs and then I thought, oh my gosh, what's the, what's the HR spin on this? What is she going to say that I did? So I called my buddy Tony from Leading with Power. He's our director down at Lacrosse. 2.30 in the morning and I'm shaking. And I'm telling him what happened. I'm like, I need, you, I need somebody to know what happened. I need you to know what happened. Did I do the right thing? What should I do? He was there for me. I started to learn these different things, guys. Now here's, the, here's even better news. There's a chapter four man. Chapter four man is the man from right here where you are. I don't know what your circumstances are. But what I do know is, you get a group of men, there is not one of us that is perfect in this room. We all have our ups, our downs, our struggles, some of them worse than others. But what I do know is that most of us struggle in silence and keep the worst parts about us in silence. Now, the man in the future can be now moving forward. The man you know you should be. The man you know you could be. The man you wish you would be. A disciplined man. A man that says no with confidence to what you don't want so that you can say yes to what you do want in life. That puts a definition of manhood in a higher calling the higher calling of God's model, decides consciously the man he wants to be and the influence. God, there's a lot of power in men, guys. And guys, what models do we have out there? Professional athletes? Good Lord. Okay? Think of, think of your average man on a television show, on a sitcom. What, what, is, what is, what's the man like? He's kind of an idiot, usually. Right? He's not strong. He's not a leader. Not until lately, until Yellowstone. Now there's some pretty dang cool men on Yellowstone. <laughs> All right? But, you go back to chapter one, Danny Odenbach sure couldn't find a, a man to, to follow. Okay? You have tons of influence. Ask yourself, where am I on this journey? Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, Chapter 4, man. Where do I want to be? What stand do you want to make? Who of you in the room will be the David for your families and slay the Goliaths? Maybe it's addiction. Maybe, maybe it's poor decisions financially. I don't know what it is. You guys know what it is. I guarantee you know, because I sat for years in talks like this, knowing exactly was it what it was, and quietly just saying, my gosh, I hope nobody knows. Now here's the thing, guys. I know we're coming right up towards the tail end. But I challenge you as a brother. What is it that you're going to do? What is it that you should do? What challenges have you been through? Next slide. What do you need to start doing? What do you need to stop doing? Now this happened in lacrosse too. This phone call would have been a lot cooler if he answered. <laughs> but that's my dad. Now today, I can't provide the forgiveness for my dad under my own power. But my dad's an old man. He's a sad old man. 
I'm called to obey him. I'm called to honor him. And if he picked up what you would have heard as, Hey, Danny! My son's heard it. I'd say, Hey, Dad, how are you? Oh, I'm good. How are you? I'm good, Dad. Yeah, this man, this man doesn't recall, doesn't know what he did. And you know what? I'm not judge and jury. But I can love him, and that helps me be a better man every day. So guys, I appreciate your time. Thank you for listening to the story of Danny Odenbach. But guys, I leave you. What can you start doing today? What could you stop? How can you be a different chapter four man as you leave here today? Thank you.